it's going to be my pleasure to uh, welcome our, our next pleasant speaker, uh, who's going to shift the balance somewhat, I think, um, from that uh, science and social science background and the um, uh, uh, role of libraries in particular, um, into understanding, um, well, things that, frankly, I'm listening to, waiting to hear what I need to understand. Uh, so, um, Melissa Terrace, who in some sense um, is our local speaker, that is to say, there is not an institution perhaps more local than the uh, University College London, uh, just down the road. She knows it very well. She told me how she walked backwards and forwards prior to this meeting to get here. Uh, and um, so that the impact that UCL has made and uh, to digital scholarship is well known to us and well understood. And so it, it's with great delight that I, I hand to Melissa. Thank you very much. Thanks, here we go. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, first of all, I was asked to talk about data preservation and digital preservation in the humanities. I'm a bit wary, though, of being this is the voice of the humanities. I know you can hear us, digital preservation. I'm not a typical humanities scholar, and also I wouldn't like to talk to the breadth of research in the humanities, which is as big as the breadth of research in the sciences, right? So what I can talk to you about today is some of the stuff that we come across in my role within the digital humanities. And the second thing I'm not interested in is the whole two tribes thing, the whole science versus the humanities. I think that's a little bit of a red herring, and the one take home message that I have today, so you can go and get a coffee now if you don't want to listen to the rest of my talk, is we have as many problems in the humanities with digital curation as you do in the sciences. Our data is as complex, our needs are as complex, but we don't have any money to deal with it. Ta-da! <laughs> the other thing, we are not as green as we are cabbage looking, which by the way is a quote from both Shakespeare and Joyce, our Irish humanities types, we like to toss these kind of things into presentations. We are used to dealing with lots of different sources of data. That's the nature of the humanities. We're trying to piece together what we understand about past and present cultures, civilizations, societies, and humans. And we do that looking at the past and present historical record of humankind. Now, my discipline, if I ever had a core discipline, is classics. I did my PhD about texts found at Vindolanda, a Roman fort on Hadrian's Wall. There were two types of texts, ink texts and stylus texts. And my PhD was on the stylus texts, which are really very hard to read. This is the surface of a stylus text. It's reused over and over and over again. They pour wax on the top, they dig a letter into it, they send it somewhere else, they scrape off the wax, they pour wax on, they dig the letter back, they send it back. So this is what we're trying to read and to understand. And to do that, we have to look at a whole range of information and data sources. Not all of them analog, not all of them digital. We use a range of anything we can find to help us inform what we understand. So we look at other texts, other texts in museums. We look at archaeological records, whether or not they are digital or in print. We look at sketches people have made of other texts found throughout the world. We look at the art historical record. We look at published books, both in analog and in digital. We look at other letters and other forms that have been found to look at the actual letter forms themselves and the individual glyphs. We look at graphs to understand where these letters would have travelled throughout the Roman world so we can understand the language people are using. And finally, we look at analysis of grammar and analysis of the difference between classical Latin and vulgar Latin, some of which is informed through co computational scholarship and some of which is analogue. So we don't really care if a data source is digital or analogue. We just want to get the information to do it. And this has all gone blank, just as I was about to talk about shoes. There we go. Um, at the bottom, here, we have a shoe that was found at Vindolanda. Now, we know from the letters at Vindolanda that there are 25 different styles of shoes, which were the fashion at the time. And the archaeological records have dug up these 25 different styles of shoes, which were the fashion at the time. But there's always going to be a disconnect between our understanding of the past and the information we have at the present. We know there are 25 types of shoes. We know what their names are, but we can't tell which shoe had which name. That's gone forever. We're used to dealing with this fragmentary data sources. 
And we can bring in advanced digital techniques to this. This is the kind of stuff that I've been doing. So we can do stuff like we can fix illumination and digitization. You won't be able to see that very clear on the screen. But if I show you another slide, which is where the fancy computing stuff comes in, which is let's remove all the wood grain in these images. Ta-da! And you can take off wood grain through image processing and you can get a little bit more back of what might be the mark caused by human hand versus the mark caused by noise. This is the kind of stuff that I'm doing. But that's only one small cog in the wider information environment, which then taps back into the classical record, be it analog, be it digital, be it banks of other letter forms, be it banks of grammar, to try and understand what this poor little document says. So there we have it. There's a complex relationship between the digital and the analog in the humanities, and we understand that. We understand that we can use the digital to try and inform our understanding of the past. We know, and we deal with all the time, we deal with data loss and information loss all the time. Historians know how to integrate data loss into their practices and it's part of the methods of looking at the scraps and remnants of the historical past to deal with that. We know how frustrating, come on we know how frustrating, there we go, we know how frustrating this is and we cannot let ourselves get emotional about this because this is the method in the humanities. We're used to dealing with scrappy data sets, right? Um, I'm going to show you this one, which I found, which the, uh, this is where the science and humanities thing comes in. Physicist says, according to conservation of information, nothing is ever truly lost. And the historian says, so where's my library of Alexandria? <laughs> and the person making this meme can't even spell physicist, right, at the top. <laughs> so um, there we go. Um, I'm going to finish this kind of selection of memes at the Library of Alexandria about um, the destruction of data sources. And yes, then there's a understanding within, his, within the historical community and within the arts and humanities that we do deal with a lack of stuff. We have to be careful about our own data. We have to be careful about it. Um, but this is a very real thing. And I'm aware now I'm switching from, haha, this is funny, to talk immediately about a disaster in our community, in the library community, which has happened over the past week in Moscow, with the loss of a major library and the loss of Probably, they don't know yet, but the news yesterday was they've lost all the digital catalogue for this library in the massive fire. They've got the paper catalogue, that's the good news, because a library without a catalogue is, you know, but, but we are talking about losses which happen that we have to deal with as scholars all the time. And the thing in Moscow, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a real tragedy. Um, but going on from that, going back to the whole we're not as green as cabbage looking thing, if you want us to prove that we know a little bit about data management and we know a little bit about how to look after our own data, we can, of course, look to the wonderful Arts and Humanities Data Service 1996 to 2008, RIP. Um, what shall I say about this? I have to be polite because I'm publicly speaking and I'm being filmed, so I can't say too much. But... Um, the role of the Arts and Humanities Data Service was, of course, to advise us on issues about data creation and data preservation, and it was to help us store the data afterwards. Now, they were very good at these two things, and also they were ahead of the curve, ahead of a lot of the discussions in the sciences about this. And I understand why the service is no longer available, but what I will say is the things that they helped with, getting people to write the technical appendix for their research, getting people to review the technical appendix for the research, and then looking at the data, the, after the data sets afterwards, all of that stuff has been pushed back onto academics. We're now supposed to help people write all the stuff and review these technical appendices for people and is also being pushed back onto institutions. So now when you get a grant, you have to look after your digital data set for up to 10 years within your own institutional repository rather than parking it with the AHDS. Ta -da. And this is where my own institution comes in. I'm at UCL, just across the road. I'm going to put up the number one in the ref for research trend thing. I have absolutely no idea what that means. I'm sure many other people don't too. It's like, yeah, great. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're a big university. We've got a lot going on. There's a lot of opportunities to do stuff. Um, is Max Wilkinson here, by the way? Is Max here this morning? He said he was going to be here. Um, so the head of the research uh, data services in uh, UCL, it's run by Max Wilkinson, and over the past couple of years they've been sorting out our data storage need. 
that's the really polite way to say it. The other way to say it is it's only in the past year I have had anywhere at UCL to store data. So I've been at UCL for 12 years. It's one of the leading universities in the world. And prior to last year, where I finally had something on the petabyte storage system, I had nowhere at all to save any digital content. So how did I manage, like most people? I had some standalone hard drives that sat on my different desk. I had an off-site standalone backup that I used to periodically drop off at my mum's house. I paid myself for some digital backup from a commercial provider, and I relied on DVDs, Dropbox, you know, all the stuff that you all know about. So this is at one of the best universities in the world. This is what we were doing until just a year ago. Did I ever lose any data? I'd like to say, no, I did not, but that's not quite true. The one thing that I lost last year was the first website I ever built. And this was in 1997. This was my master's dissertation on Greek art. Um, and it had been at the University of Glasgow parked on one of their servers ever since. And it was still has quite a lot of hits. It's linked through from Wikipedia as being the one thing about these two Greek sculptures. And um, so even though it's, it's, uh, it's old and look at it, bless. You know, it took me a month to hand code that side sidebar. April 1997, that's when it became fashionable to have a sidebar on websites. Oh, yeah, I was there. Um, so I had this, and you know, it's a huge bit of work. It is like 20,000 words of content about Greek sculpture, which I was very proud of, even though it looks like, you know, days from gone your. Um, and I lost it because the server at Glasgow went down. Luckily, the Digital Curation Centre at Glasgow have fantastic backups. So I sent this panicky email. I didn't realise this thing meant so much to me as it did. But anyway, they managed to get me a copy. We managed to put it on another server and now I have proper backups of this as well. So that's the only thing I've actually lost through this kind of hodgepodge method of saving stuff. I was sitting next to Max at a meeting last week and he laughed because he noticed on my Apple Mac, my Mac Air, this S button is worn out because I have this tick of you know, saving things because I was one of these generation that grew up with Windows being so awful and crashing all the time. So every 30 seconds I save my work, you know? It's how it goes, I've worn out the S button. Um, but we now have this facility at UCL for saving data that we need. I've got permission to show you this graph, which is the usage just in the past four weeks of this data service. And the interesting thing about it, there's two things. Firstly, it is the, mostly the sciences which are using the storage facility, but the Faculty of Arts and Humanities are using 2% of it, as are the Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences. So we do have some large scale data that we need to save. The third thing I want to point out is the Faculty of the Built Environment are not using it at all. And I asked, I was like, what, what are the architects doing with all their data? Then. And three people turned around to me at the same time and went, hard drives on their desks, you know? So there's still the message is not getting through within our institution that we can actually have somewhere to park stuff. But that's not the whole story about things. It's having something to park it that's understanding what you're doing with parking the stuff. It's also being able to pay for it long term and to, to maintain this data even within an institutional context because it is not free at UCL for us to use this facility. It is at the moment, but it, it will not be going forward. So my role, one of my roles at UCL is leading the Digital Humanities Centre. And what we are doing with that, we're also helping people to bootstrap digital projects, but also looking after the outputs of these digital projects and working very closely with the data centre and also the library to build front ends for these kind of things, to look after the data and to maintain the kind of services that we all say in grant applications. Oh yeah, we'll look after this for 10 years after the grant finishes. <laughs> That's right, we will. So we're trying to make that actually happen because if you go back and check projects from five or six years ago there's a lot of them have disappeared not at UCL but a lot of them have disappeared across the globe we all make these promises we have to actually keep them so what I'm going to do now for the last uh, half of this talk I'm going to run through five or six projects that we've got at UCL very very quickly just to show the range and complexity of data that we have in the humanities so you can see that claim that we have just as many problems as the sciences would do so I'm going to run through what the data needs are for each project and then I'm going to get you to guess how much the project budget is for that project so we can factor in any costs for looking after this data over the next 10 years. So you've all got to play along at this because I'm not going to advance any slides until I actually have some audience participation. Right, and the first one's a very real object, a very real object indeed. This is uh, Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy, meet the people here. I thought this talk was at the British Library this morning, so I was going to go, this is a joint project with the British Library, but we're not at the British Library, are we? We're further down the road. I said as I was running down the road to come here. Um, 
So well, this is a joint project with the British Library. Jeremy Bentham, of course, we have his head at UCL. We also have his body that's in the, in, the, in the cloisters. He's a leading jurist, a leading philosopher in the mid-18th century, incredibly important for a whole range of legal things like the setting up of the legal system in Australia, the setting up of the legal system in America, um, women's rights, animal rights, the stopping of the transportation of, of uh, uh, convicts to Australia, all of that. He was a real mover and a shaker. He also worked on the Panoptican prisons um, and he designed a, a prison f uh, system that um, never got founded here, but there are prisons throughout the world based on his principles. He's not the founder of UCL. People think he's the founder of UCL. He isn't. He did influence the group that went on to found UCL and so we got his body and his head after he died. And we also got 60,000 folios and special collections of his handwriting um, and 40,000 of those have never been transcribed. And there's another 40,000 in the British Library, hence joining up with the British Library. And what we've done over the past four years is we have built uh, an online crowdsourcing <coughs> project called Transcribe Bentham, and we put up these images of these documents, and then we ask for volunteers to transcribe them. This has been very successful. Over the past three years that the project has been live, we have now transcribed five and a half million words of Bentham's writings. We've got another 30 or so million words to go, but we've done five and a half million words in the past three years. We have a core group of about 30 people that come to the website every day working on this for up to two or three hours a day. So we are gradually digitising all the stuff, both at UCL and the British Library, putting it up, and the community is helping us to transcribe it. And it's all stored in TI compliant XML so we can do interesting things with the text afterwards. So this is an example. You get, you get um, the manuscript and then people then help us transcribe it and then we have these outputs that say exactly what it is. An example of the kind of things that we're finding, when he set up these prisons, he really designed the prisons to the, the very smallest degree. Um, so as well as designing furniture for pregnant female prisoners, including sketches, he wrote a, a recipe book for what the prisoners should eat. So we have this recipe book. This is for uh, apple pie. Um, boil and mash the apple, stir in malt dust and treacle. Mmm, <laughs> tasty. Um, and this is really interesting for us. We we're using this, we're going, then we're passing this to the publishers at UCL. So the Bentham cookbook is about to come out by UCL Press, the fine art of 18th century prison cooking. Um, <laughs> quite seriously. Um, so, you know, it's interesting for us, we're discovering more about the history, but we're also be able to use the outputs from this. Um, there we have the apple pudding. Once you've actually made it, doesn't it look nice? Um, but what we didn't realise, once you've got five million words of transcribed images and you've got the images and they're all double-checked, cross-checked by someone who's got a PhD in Bentham Studies, we've got a really nice data set then that we can train computers to read human handwriting. Ah, so we're part of a, a Framework 7 project called Transcriptorium, which actually works. Like three years down the line, we've got the first things coming out. Um, you can go to the Transcriptorium website, you can play with these kind of things and we're getting 97% accuracy at reading historical copper plate handwriting. Ah, so these kind of things snowball into each other, which means we have various data requirements and preservation requirements. With Transcript Bentham, we've got the images. We've got 100,000 images, high-resolution images. We've also got the transcripts that people have typed in that are based on a Wikimedia system. We've also got the TI compliant XML, which comes off that. We've got the partial transcripts. Some people start stuff and then don't finish it. We've got all the information from the social media platform about who's using this stuff. So we've got personal information about users. We also have to liaise very carefully with the library and provide all the metadata for all the stuff so we can reuse it again. We have a platform on Wikimedia, which has some plugins that we've developed. So we have to maintain the software as well. So this isn't an easy thing. This isn't a build a website. This is a huge issue about data and looking after information and looking after what happens next. How much do you think that in the last four years, how much have we spent on this project? Anyone, come on, come on. I know it's early in the morning. I know you're all hungover, but come on. <laughs> Fifty thousand pounds higher. A <laughs> hundred thousand higher. Two hundred. Higher. Three hundred. Higher. 
It's about £450,000 over the past four years that we've spent. Half of that has gone on digitisation, right? So, and then the third of that has gone on the building the platform, and the rest of the money is on the people driving the system behind the scenes and publicity. And actually, now we're at the stage where economically it works out it's cheap to have this because we've done all the development, we actually have it. But I will tell you this, in our original plan, did we have a budget line for storing the data and looking after the data long term? No. no. Right, here we go. Here's another project. This is uh, UCL DH plus UCL Computing Science in links with London Metropolitan Archives. And we're looking at the great parchment book of the Honourable the Irish Society. That's not a typo. It is the Honourable the Irish Society. So this is a, it's like the Doomsday Book, but for Northern Ireland or what is now Northern Ireland in 1632. So the king at the time believed that he, the king of England believed that he owned London Derry or Derry, depending on what you believe is the history there. And he sent his people over to make a catalogue of all the lands that the guilds in London owned in Ireland. That book was burnt in 1786. No one has been able to look at it since. They did save it because it was so important, but no one's been able to look at it because look, it's shriveled, it's crumpled, it's, it's all mashed up. So what we did is we went in there. I'm going to ask now for the first video to be triggered, the first one with the person in it. We went in and we thought whether or not we could digitise this in a new and advanced way to actually be able to read it. So here we have Kazim, our PhD student, and he takes up to two or 300 pictures of each individual folio, and we'll see the curator go and flip it over. He's not allowed to touch it. He comes back and he does the other side. Then what we do after that is we use a technique called photogrammetry and can I put the second video on, please? Uh, we then build a, a virtual reality model of the, each folio, and then we can navigate it in the computer, and we can virtually straighten it out. Look at that. How cool is this? This won the Succeed Award for Digitization last year. Um, so what we're allowing then is people to actually look at the document and be able to see it, and we're kind of correcting for some of the damages which is actually coming. We've since put up this website. Um, it, it's been retranscribed. We've read another 30% of the document that couldn't be read before. It's all online. Uh, back to my normal slides, please. <laughs> so we have these models, and we have these lovely things, and there are 260 folios. So... When we have, oh, this is in case my video didn't work. Look, we flattened stuff out. Um, so what do we have? We have, for each of these 260 folios, we have up to 500 high-resolution images. They all have to be catalogued. We have both sides as well, so that's 1,000 per each page. We then have a computational model for each one. But we've developed a software for this, and this is a student project, a student project. So you can imagine how well the software is catalogued. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It's a very successful student project. What was the cost of this project? The four-year PhD studentship. 100,000. 100, it is around about 100,000. And how the maths for this works is the EPSRC put in 60,000 pounds. We had to find 40,000 pounds. And the nice story about this is because it was about the guilds in London and how they had operated in Northern Ireland, we went round all the guilds, the butchers, the bakers, the candlestick makers, and we asked them all for 1,000 pounds and they put it all in and we had the funding for a PhD studentship. And we've worked on this and we've done it. We've read this document that hasn't been read before. The problem we have with this, do you think we put a budget line in the project <laughs> to ask about how we were going to look after the images, the data, the software? No, we didn't. And now we're at the stage where we have done something which seemed quite impossible at the start of the project, but we don't necessarily have the means to carry it forward or to turn it into a service. And we'd like to do this with our other deteriorated documents because we don't have enough investment to be able to deal with that. And we're at a risk. If we don't do something with the software in the next year or so, we won't be able to take it forward. And it will be this lovely pilot project which showed what could be done, but hasn't actually helped the wider sector in the way that it could do. Another thing that um, I work on quite a lot at the moment is multispectral imaging. So usually when you take an image, you usually look at the um, same range of colour that the human eye can see because we want to produce digitisation which you know, we can see. But there are different ways now that you can use digitisation to capture things in infrared, in ultraviolet and in every shade in between. And this is interesting because different inks react to different wavelengths of light. So if you have two inks written on top of each other and you image them just in the blue or just in the infrared, you you might be able to peel them out and be able to see which is different. The problem with this is that uh, 
all the examples of this type of imaging that have been done, and there have been some very high profile examples, you might have seen the thing about the Magna Carta a couple of weeks ago, which is about infrared, we managed to read some more things of the Magna Carta than had previously been available. The problem with this is most examples are really high profile documents. So they're things which are already damaged that we're trying to read some more of. <laughs> We had nothing in the sector to be able to compare and contrast before and after. What works and what doesn't with this technology? What are the limits of these technology? What does it work on best? Does it work if documents are covered in acid? A very common thing. Does it work if documents are covered in blood? A very common thing. We didn't know. So what we did is we got a lovely charter from London Metropolitan Archives from about 1750. It was being deaccessioned, which is the posh name for throwing it in the bin. And uh, they gave it to us instead. And we cut it up. We cut it into 28 different pieces. And we imaged it before in a various modalities. And then we imaged it, well, then we destroyed it in various ways. So we cooked it, we poured blood on it, human blood on it. See, getting that past the ethics board. We need some human blood to pour on a document. Um, we... Uh, you know, th we did all these various things. We, we identified 28 different ways that documents are commonly destroyed in archives. We imaged it before, we then destroyed the things, and then we imaged them afters in four different modalities. Here we have Lindsay MacDonald, an expert in digitization of cultural heritage, taking these images. So by the end of it, of these 28 samples, we had over 3,000 different images of this data set. And we can then process that and we can understand where, where and when we can get text back when, when parchment has been damaged. So this shows before, then with analyzed eye, which the human eye just can't see anything through, but we can recapture using a particular modality. We can get back some of the writing underneath. So we have now this wonderful data set. And one of the outputs of this, we have just submitted a paper to a, to a journal in the past week for this. We want to publish with the paper, we want to publish this data set. So we have 2,800 images, but we have them in four different modalities. And we also have the raw files, the DNG files, the archival TIFF, and the JPEGs that we can use them for publication. So when we're now at 10,000 high resolution images of this one document that we want to package up in a nice way and say, anyone else working on image processing of historical documents, come and play with our data set. You want to look at how ACID has interacted with, with iron gall ink on a parchment, we are your people. Here it is, take it, take it, take it and play. But we've got a terabyte of data. And where do we park that? Now, I am assured that UCL will have this sorted within the next month. And we will have a public facing data store that we can park these reference data sets. Because that's what this is, a reference data set. And we can't just put it on my web page. I don't have enough web space. We can't put it on the library system. They don't have enough web page. And it's not necessarily something that you would browse through either. You either want the whole terabyte or you want none of it, right? So it is a different thing. And this is something which has emanated from a combination of libraries and the humanities and library science. And information studies looking at this technique in the sector and this is a real problem for us so the data itself is not just the, the keeping it for the project but it's also how we make it available to other people after and these reference data sets are going to become more and more important as we do uh, testing of digitization technologies had we budgeted for data storage and making this available at the end of the project this was this was a phd Project. So again, £100,000 like the last time. Um, but there's no, there's no budget for this going forward and for hosting this online. Very quickly, I'm just going to whiz through a couple of things. We made an app. We made an app called Texto. You can take any stream from social media, you can grab the text, you can make visualizations of it, and then you can see things like, oh, the word museums appear 47 times in this document, and it's a very important word. Um, we can look at collocations. And think it's like a mini text analysis. On, it only works on iPhone. <laughs> Um, over 101 million words have been processed through this. It's been up for 18 months now. It's been used in 45 different countries and six different languages we offer it in. And we have up nearly 3,000 regular users. It's downloaded about five times a week. It's a very nice thing. We wanted to make an app. We want, I wanted to see what, what it took to make an app. Um, so with that, we have streams of social media content, which gets into all kinds of legal issues about how you store that. We have data about people, about who's using it. We have data about their location. We know where and when they're using 
using it and we're trying to ascertain why. Um, there are huge ethical issues as well as data storage issues. The data server farm that drives this at UCL, I'm not even sure they know that we're, dri we're driving this app off the back of it. It was kind of one of these things, like, oh, well, we'll just set this up and we'll see if anyone notices. But um, looking, <laughs> looking, and UCL's great for that kind of thing. It's all about, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. Um, so we're allowed to kind of bootstrap these things and have a go and see if we can do these things. But storing this data long term, and this, my friends, this is the crunch point. Okay, so I have an app which was developed and launched successfully to market and has a server farm. What is the budget for that? And I'll give you a clue. Instagram, when they wanted to put their um, app out for Android, they raised over a million dollars in venture capital funding to launch that version of the app. So we took an app from nothing to market. What was our budget for doing that? 25,000. Lower. 5, Lower. Zero. Higher. <laughs> it was 3,333 pounds. I got an app to market for 3,333 pounds. Oh, yeah. And people complain that there's not an Android version. I just go, you know what? <laughs> no. Um, but the problem we have now is that going forward with the UCL data service, the cost for us storing any data for any project, so not for a department, but for each project, is going to be £3,000 for the lifetime of the project. So when you're doing your project plan, you're supposed to write in a line that says, and £3,000 will go back towards the data storage, and that'll be it for the next 10 years. They promise to look after the data. But in the arts and humanities, we're often offered, there's £3,000 to do some experimental research. Can you do something? Of course, yes. We're at the Digital Humanities Centre. We'll roll up our sleeves and we'll put out an app. Um, but we can't afford the, even the internal costs for data storage, and we can't budget them in because it's a difference between doing the project at all or not. And this is something we need to have a discussion with because we're competing with people in the life sciences and brain surgery and in the, um, not the architects because they're using their things on their desks, but the people in engineering science, they're all getting the half a million pound projects and they can very easily write 3,000 pounds in the line. And we can't because we're used to dealing with such small project funding. This, this is a scan of the Science Museum Shipping Gallery. So the Science Museum Shipping Gallery had been available for 50 years as it was. We went in with the lasers, we scanned it overnight for, for a week, and we made a complete digital model of the Science Museum Shipping Gallery. It's a beautiful thing. You can even read the labels on each thing. This is before they dismantled it, and now it's, uh, the space is now the Google Galleries there. But it itself was a museum exhibit because it was about the 1950s and how you put things into an art gallery, uh, to a museum gallery. Um, and so we wanted to preserve it. And now we can fly through it. There is an online video, um, if you were to just search YouTube Science Museum uh, Shipping Gallery, and you'll be able to see this kind of video of flying through. Now we have this data set, seven terabytes, seven terabyte point cloud data set. We have a PhD students working on usability and accessibility of these types of data sets for the heritage sector, because what you're going to do with seven terabytes, most people don't have the facilities to be able to process that after. Um, and the data for this then, we have a seven terabyte model of the Science Museum. Do either UCL or the Science Museum have a copy of this data currently? That'll be no, <laughs> it's with someone else. And we need to figure out where we're going to park this and how we're going to look after it. And if we don't do it soon, it'll be lost. You know, A fantastic piece of work. So we have to be careful about that. The budget for this, what's the budget for going into a major museum overnight for a week with five people with scanners to collect a huge data set, then, then to spend a month building this model? What's the budget for that? Zero. Just slightly higher. It was a thousand pounds we had to spend on that. So if we're now being asked for three thousand pounds to store it for the next ten years, we just can't. And what might be the output of all this is just the video on YouTube, right? And that might be enough. But at the same time, we have these real problems accessing the services because we have no money. And the final thing I want to, the final project I want to talk about is another project that's joint with the British Library. We have a really nice link up. Um, with computing science students and the Digital Humanities Centre and the British Library. The computing science final year students over the past 10 years, they've been going out to industry to do a project as a dissertation and most of them have gone into the financial industries. But last year we sent a team of people to the British Library instead to see what they could do with their data. 
data. And the experimental service that they programmed up over a three month period is a real game changer for libraries. It allows people to search, or it allowed, it was only up for a, for a few weeks, it allowed people to search the entire out of copyright works on the British libraries and then download a corpus, not just one thing. For example, if you're interested in how French words were used in the books that were printed in London when the French Revolution was happening, give me any book which is any French verb that was published in London between these days. And instead of getting like your normal Google, Google search, link, 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 you're like, here's your zip file. Here's your 300 books, all zipped up for you. Do you want the images? Do you want the OCR? Do you want both? Just, you know, here it is. This is the answer to your query, which is not one thing, but it's a whole set. And here you go. You can take it away and you can do whatever you like with it because it's out of copyright and we're giving all this stuff away free. So it's a different way of searching out of copyright collections. And this for the arts and humanities is going to be the game changer because it allows people then not to crawl through catalogues and crawl through collections one by one by one. But it is, here is my query. Give me the sources. Let me do the analysis of that after and take this away and see what I can find from it. It was experimental. It was um, on a Microsoft Azure system, and the, the student, we have a link with Microsoft as well. So they allow us to do these kind of really high performance searches. And this is where it comes out to the computing power behind this, and whether or not we can get that working on a service. The BL don't have the resources just now, and might in future, to, to offer this. But we got it working, and we had the system where you could get your gigabyte of books that you wanted to download and take away, or just the text if you wanted to do things. So that was a very successful project. Again, a three-month project. The data from this then, we have the software, again, student projects, so they try to catalogue in it, but it's not necessarily the best metadata and that that we have about the system itself. It's available on GitHub, we, so if anyone else wants to play with this stuff with the, the API, they can. Um, the Content itself is still at the British Library, so they still have their million books that have been digitised. Um, but what we're looking at here is how we create a record of these short-term student projects, which are often doing very experimental, very good work, which are going to benefit the arts and humanities and social historical sciences hugely. And it's how we create a, a snapshot of that. And what was the budget for this? Anyone, what was the budget for this three month student project involving final year students? Zero. Zero! Yes, we finally got to zero. It's apart from staff time. And as you know, we've all got lots of time to spend on everything. <laughs> Um, so, but you know, it's fine. It's the kind of thing that comes along. You go, yeah, sure. Like, I, we'll take this on. We'll do these things, and we all kind of pitch in. We do these little projects, and we'll, we will be having a poster about it at the Digital Humanities Conference in Sydney. You know, that kind of thing. So, we we do get academic outputs about the, this kind of thing too. Um, but it's a real problem for us about looking after the stuff that we are doing in the digital space, simply because we don't have the budget. I don't want to give the impression that I'm unhappy with what's happening at UCL, though, because they have been immensely supportive and they have been engaging with us in the Digital Humanities Centre and they have been engaging with the social and historical sciences too to try and make sure that our needs are incorporated into digital preservation at UCL as well as the sciences. They are listening to us. They are helping us. They are allowing us to do some things free or without this budget line. You know, that when you say, well, wait a minute, this whole project costs £3,000. How can we possibly pay for it? They are listening to us and they're listening to our concerns. So it is about, if one thing, it is about listening to the concerns about budget and resources that people from this sector as well as museums and libraries actually have and being able to pay for these paid resources in comparison to the sciences because the arts and humanities, they have no money left in this machine. The cuts which are happening to us in the university sector are huge and how we're having to deal with it is problematic and we certainly don't, we can't compete with the sciences on the money, we just can't compete. We're lucky at UCLDH, we report both to the arts and humanities faculty and to the engineering faculty, so we're lucky that we have some input into getting these types of resources, but a lot of digital humanities centres don't, a lot of them are in arts and humanities faculties and they just don't have access to resources which cost a lot of money. It is complicated. Our data needs, our digital preservation needs, our storage needs are complicated. It's no easier than any of our scientific colleagues. We are generating large scale data sets. We are generating software. We are generating uh, 
data where you can spot named individuals and we have to deal with the ethics of all that. You know, there are issues in all of the data that I've showed you today about size, about storage, about formats, all the stuff that you guys know about. I don't have to go on about it here. But we have as many complex needs as anybody who's using a telescope in the sciences and generating a big data set, as anyone who's making some software and computing science. We have as many complex needs as they do. And this is, of course, is where the Digital Humanities Centre at UCL comes in. It's our job to try and navigate this, both for our own projects and for the people coming behind us. So when someone else rocks up from history and goes, yeah, I got these books from the British Library and I don't quite know where to park them or what to do with them, we can help because we've helped clear the way and we've helped beat the path for what they can do with their data, both before and after acquisition. So it's about a pipeline, it's about helping set up a pipeline within our institution for how people can get from A to B with their digital uh, needs, with, with the, the need to store information, with the need to process information, which is a whole different talk. But um, it's about helping people and helping clear that way so that people know the pipeline when they come to us and we can help. I just want to finish by closing again that gap between the arts and humanities and the sciences. We've just had an investment from the EPSRC at UCL for a doctoral training centre in science, science and engineering for the arts, heritage and archaeology. So these problems and issues are not going away. We now have 10 PhD students a year for the next eight years working on computational and engineering and physical sciences applied to heritage, applied to archaeology. They will be making huge data sets. They will be making software. They will be informing how other people coming behind them can use these technologies. And we have to find a way to try and store this data, to preserve it, and also to communicate what we're doing to the wider sector. We all know that more information is coming soon, right? The data sets that we are making now, with my multispectral kit, we can make a terabyte of data in five minutes. So the data that we are creating, it's not small, and we need to find the way that we can preserve it within the arts and humanities so that we can get back to studying how people live, so we can get back to studying humankind, hu human society, so we can do computational analysis which benefits our understanding of the past and present human society. I started off with two preambles. I'm going to finish with an addendum. All of the projects that I showed you here today, it's not just me. I, was, I am involved in every single one of them, but... Um, they're interdisciplinary teams, there are often large teams, and there's a whole range of people involved in doing this, from librarians, from conservators, from PhD students, from engineers, from computing scientists, art historians, uh, curators, you know, the whole range of stuff is represented on this slide. Digital humanities projects in this area are often interdisciplinary, large team, and we have to navigate what we need for, or what all these different type of people need from the storage of the digital information that's created in the projects so that we can take this forward and look after our data in years to come. Thanks very much. Well, I'm going to ask you to uh, forego your caffeine drag uh, because we've got to have ample opportunity, I think, for some questions and discussions on this. <coughs> I've already written down some things I've, I've noted and... and Acronyms are back, and, and TIA, uh, TEI, for example, okay. there, it, uh, that lives on. Yeah. And also the iconic value of the uh, AHDS, which is obviously our digital equivalent of the Alexandra Library having burnt down. We will be talking about this forever. Uh, it's a useful lesson in that sense. That so. I mean, reading some of the tweet stream that's coming through, and there is celebration for scumbag Steve, uh, <laughs> just to let you know that that was known. And also that this um, creed that you've already given us, uh, which is to ask for forgiveness, uh, not permission. Uh, so with that, can I open the floor for questions, please? Mike. Um, There's a microphone. <laughs> Mike. I'm surprised that when you worry about the cost that you keep talking about terabytes and the storage. I mean, a terabyte of disk is now about $50 and Amazon would charge you $10 a month. Yeah. So isn't all of the cost really in the people that have to catalog it and take care of it? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's not just about parking it somewhere, right? It's making sure that it's, it's um, available to other people, but also catalog properly, that we can pay for the cost of making it available. This, this whole thing about making a, the reference data sets available has hit a, a, what's the word? 
bottleneck, that's the word, a bottleneck with the, because we're at the switch of making research papers available and data sets available and all of this, which is part of the whole shift in open access just now within the university system. And then we come along going, yeah, we've got this massive thing and they don't have the time to deal with that as well as the kind of public outreach things. Um, so we're... We will see a change in that. But for us, if it is a budget line thing, though. If we've been asked to park it within the institutional context, and we all say within the grants that we're going to park it within an institutional context, not on Amazon, not on a commercial thing, and there's a cost embedded in that, we have to find that cost somewhere. And for the arts and humanities, we don't generally have that ability. And in some of the grants that we write, we're not even allowed to put that in. So it is, it's a barrier. So it's a false barrier because storage is so cheap. And that £3,000 figure is for like the whole future. They're guaranteeing it for at least 10 years, if not more. But it's to cover the setup costs and the running costs of the Data Preservation Centre at, at UCL. So, yeah, I take your point completely. And this is why I've been paying for my own data storage from a commercial provider. And I still do, by the way. Um, for like my 20 bucks a month or whatever. And I've got all my stuff stored safely. But I have to work within an institutional context. I'm rambling now, but that, I guess that's what I'm getting to. We have to work within an institutional context, and that institutional context is setting up a false barrier for us. Okay, so that. <coughs> I said hello to Mike Lest there, so perhaps you could say who you are also, please. Oh, hi. Uh, Phil Richards from JISC. I was just interested, then, you obviously stressed the institutional context. But I've been involved in a piece of work that some of your colleagues at UCL have been in, in terms of a sh shared data centre, uh, primarily the anchor tenant being the Crick Institute, but uh, UCL moving a large amount of their high-performance computing facilities to a shared commercial premises containing a lot of sensitive health data. Um, are there different rules for, for that than, than, than apply to you? I, I, I'm not sure what the constraint is to making full use of what commercial offerings there are. Some of them are now free. I know they don't solve all the problems, particularly not the human time element and the discoverability. That's a, that's a tough one. Mm. The actual cost of storage is now f potentially free if one uses some of the commercial offerings that are available. Yeah. We have a very strict e research ethics guidelines code about storage and maintenance of data at UCL and that's actually just been updated over the past six months so it's even more strict so you have to get full ethical clearance and have a full plan on especially when you're dealing with any identifiable okay, human. Well, I mean in terms of ethics I, I would imagine that, that this health information that will be going in the shared data is probably requires the highest yeah. possible bar in that sense so if it's possible for them to, to do it I I wonder if it's possible for others to navigate that as well. I see a happy marriage happening here. Yeah. Uh, any other questions, please? Well, I think actually oh, we... Oh, sorry, sorry. Clip it. Um, uh, actually, too, a very quick one and then a, a more serious one. Um, am I understanding you right that basically the deal with the um, institutional storage is... Um, 10 years or end of project, whichever comes first? No, it's 10 years from parking of data. Uh -huh. So if the project ends, they'll still maintain the data. For 10 years? Yeah. Okay. And after that... Uh, they can't... T we, we have a saying, you see, see the 10 years are forever. No okay. one knows what happens after 10 okay. years, right? <laughs> gotcha. Uh, now, um, I, I was interested that you focused pretty heavily on... Um, retaining and maintaining the data out of these projects. A number of these projects, as I think you illustrated very um, vividly in the description of the projects, really involve a lot of software, too, yeah. that needs to be maintained. How are you think, thinking about um, uh, budgeting and projecting costs for the maintenance of software. I mean, data is kind of easy in a way. You think about it so many terabytes per year, and um, but, but software is a very people-intensive thing to maintain, I think. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I think you've hit the nail on the head, like the, the data was the easy thing to talk about. Are we still recording or are we, are we switched off? <laughs> um, I have a feeling... Like, Transcribe Bentham, right? It's based on Wikimedia. We've got these plugins, and it's all ticking along lovely. All we need to pay for just now is a two days a week of research assistant to, to monitor what's coming in. But within a year or two, so it's been up for three years, within a year or two, the wheels are going to fall off. 
and we're going to need to rewrite some of the software. We know that at current current use of the community is going to take eight years to finish transcribing. Um, so we have to find somewhere institutionally the money to pay for that person to drive it behind the scenes for eight years. Uh, but if something happens to the software, we don't have any budget at all at the moment to fix it. Um, and this is the problem with the way that projects are funded. A, you can't get follow-on funding. We, we had this very successful project that Transfer Brenton for a year was funded by the HRC and then we went back to say, can we get follow-on funding? And they went, you're not new anymore. You don't get any money for stuff that isn't you and also you don't get any money for support. So you have to find it within institutional support. And we are going to come to the crunk, uh, crunch point where we need to do some updating of that and we're going to have to find some institu institutional resources from somewhere else. And that might be where we have to start involving crowdfunding or something. Do you know, we are looking at that as a mechanism. But there is a problem within the university system of looking after these short-term projects like the Great Parchment Book. Um, what do we do with that software? We've got it. It's, the PhD student is sick of that project and is off to work in industry and make his millions, right? Fair enough. He's not interested in updating it. We have this wonderful piece of software which is you know, award-winning, can do fantastic things, but at the same time, we, don't, we have no money to do anything with it after. And it's, it's a worry. It is a worry for me. And the, it's very seldom in digital humanities that any software is reused by anyone else, right? So that's a problem. With, with Transcribe Bentham, there are at least three other places that are using it. The Moon Archive in Oslo, Letters of 1916 Project at, uh, at Dublin. Um, so there are people that are reusing it, which is great for us. There's people, but we have no mechanism for support at all. Yes, please, over there. You just say who you are so we can hear. Because you, you can't be seen at the moment, either. Yeah, there. yeah there's a, they're coming with the... Uh, Geoffrey Wilton from University of Edinburgh. Um, it's fascinating hearing you speak about the small amounts of money you, ex you, you, you expend doing rather important things. Now, I was at uh, an ESFRI meeting, which was the European Infrastructure Enterprise meeting last year, and I popped in between two rooms, one with physicists, another one with people from uh, anthropology and archaeology. And the physicist was saying, well, here's a rather important issue. It'll only cost 600 million. Let's make a bid to the EU. The anthropologist was saying, this is really important, and it was. We need about 40,000 quid for this. And I said, well, what are you talking about? You, you're not going to impress anybody with a bid for 40,000 quid. Make it two million, and then make people start listening to you. And I just, I mean, I, I, mean, I think there is a mindset. You may not have that mindset. Uh, but on the other hand, the bodies that fund have, in a sense, got to be responsive to a concept that actually just because one thing is physics and the other one's anthropology, they're not necessarily different in importance. And I just wonder, I mean, you, you, you have just explained why it's so difficult to maintain funding through conventional routes for, your, for what you do. But in the natural sciences, we have things like national capability funding. And it, I mean... No, we do You're a national that. capability. Yeah. Someone ought to be making the argument and actually talking about relativities, about how important these things are. We're, we're lucky with the EPSRC funding that we've got for the CIHA. That, I mean, that is a £9 million investment from the Engineering Research Council into how we apply this stuff to the arts, humanities and archaeology. And that's, you know, we also mean libraries and museums and stuff, so we just couldn't offer it in the acronym, you know, come up with a catchy name, see how that'll do. Um, so there, there, we have got something, that's the largest ever investment there's been into heritage science. That's a new buzzword. You all know digital humanities, but the new buzzword coming along is heritage science. Um, so there is, uh, uh, there is now an opportunity there to do some stuff. But it is something we struggle with on the current... I'm not going to go on a big rant about the current government. I stopped myself there. But um, the, what they've, the way they've been funding the arts and humanities within the university sector, at the moment, um, no undergraduate art and humanities courses are supported by government funding, right? It's all just sciences. Um, there was some talk about the student fees for, and the loans for master's level and whether arts and humanities people should be allowed to take out student loans. To, you know, there's huge barriers to people progressing in the arts and humanities, never mind the, the, the context in which we work in. And we are used to doing stuff small scale. We are used to doing stuff with very little resources 
but I am at a very good university which allows me, allows me to grab the resources which exist around it, but there's an awful lot of people that don't have that either. So it's a huge problem in moving this stuff forward and being able to understand. And I'm not sure how we get over that. I'm not sure that um, we are the people to be telling the HRC that they need to ask for more money for us. Or Do you know, this? it's a difficult one. So if anyone's got any suggestions, I'd be very... Help, I'm very happy to hear them. One final thing, I am part of a collective called Four Humanities, like with a four, like four humanities, and we're trying to drum up awareness of the importance of the arts and humanities to research and, and the world in general. So we have a very nice website and we have a very nice Twitter stream that covers like when things come out, like this is why it's important, this is why it's important. And there's a huge battle going on just now about proving our worth, which is a shame because, you know, it's, we're all about humans and we're all... We're all humans, right? But I'll go, that's a different talk and a different rant. But yes, we have a lot of difficulties and we have, I'm not really sure how to deal with that. So I must move on. Uh, can I take one short one, please? I didn't mean to say you were a short one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Ingrid Dillo and I'm from Data Archiving and Network Services in the Netherlands, a data repository for uh, social sciences and humanities data. And you ask for suggestions. Well, I very much recognize the story that you're telling about the situation here in the UK. And we had more or less the same situation in the Netherlands, where we tried to compete with the hard sciences for um, funding for research infrastructures in the area of the humanities. And always the big guys won. And we always got criticism that the humanities just keep on um, pointing out the differences between all the disciplines within humanities. So we tried a different strategy and we partnered up with 40 um, big parties in the humanities within the Netherlands. All the humanities departments of all universities were involved. And finally we were lucky and we got a 12.5 million investment um, some to put into a, a very broad humanities research infrastructure. So that might be a suggestion for you as well. Thank you. And now I think uh, we must do, and thank you very, very much for our digital education. Yeah. And as we say, haste ye back. <laughs> thank you.